Okay, so here we go. Um, OC uh, gun owners, and this is our Second Amendment discussion night. I'm here uh, with Lucas, and we've got a couple topics tonight. Um, first, this San Diego, city of San Diego, not county, um, Enough Act, which um, bans um, precursor parts, specifically unserialized receivers. So it's going to prevent you from manufacturing um, your own firearms and be even more draconian than the state level, California state level uh, regulations. And then uh, as a se second topic, we'll uh, have something a little more practical, a little less uh, conceptual or theoretical. Um, in how to uh, stay sane <laughs> and what you can do that uh, might be fun and interesting and still comply with uh, the myriad regulations uh, that are out there. So a quick few other details uh, regarding this uh, city of San Diego ordinance. So if you're not in the city of San Diego yourself, of course, the ordinance doesn't uh, apply to you. But what it would do is ban your possession of an unserialized receiver. So uh, in somewhere other than San Diego right now, you can purchase a 80% lower or an unserialized receiver, apply to the state of California for a serial number, once you receive that serial number, then you can begin manufacturing your firearm. You know, apply the serial number to uh, the receiver or you know whatever the uh, serialized part is. You apply the serial number and you manufacture, it. and that's perfectly legal, uh, at least at the moment. Now, of course, uh, there is a law, and they've stepped up the enforcement date, and I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but it's now that all precursor parts have to go through an FFL. So you wouldn't be able to have them shipped to your house, but conceivably after yet another layer of bureaucracy, a background check, you could still get your 80% um, frame lower, whatever. And then uh, once you apply for a serial number, um, begin to manufacture. But uh, this in the city of San Diego would prevent you from even doing that because it bans possession and uh, of those uh, either unserialized frames or I guess if you had an 80% and then you know you started to manufacture it at some point you would have an unserialized frame. I guess maybe if you serialize the 80% and did it, but I guess we can get into that. So. Uh, I guess that's my first thought is maybe they haven't considered this, that you buy an 80%, which isn't, uh, if they're banning precursor parts, I guess I should go look at the uh, language of the ordinance precisely. But um, I don't know what they define as a precursor part. If, you know, 80% is technically just a slab of metal, it's not even a precursor part, unless they call it out specifically as such. So I guess maybe you could get some hunk of metal, including an 80%, put a serial number on it, and you never have an unserialized frame or lower. It's serialized by the time you get to frame or lower. Uh, but anyway, this is what it's attempting to do. It's attempting to prevent you from manufacturing your own firearms, period. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Well, it, this is this is my thought. Um, it you know, it's just logical that if you can't go out and buy, say, a Glock of whatever flavor you want to because it's fallen off the roster, then the thing to do is to get a polymer 80 frame or, you know, whatever else that you might want to get and then 
you can just manufacture your own and you're going to have to develop some skills and do a little learning, but you know, you can get there if you just have enough confidence and you consider yourself a capable human being, you can learn these skills and, and, and do these things. And the bottom line is it's not about preventing crime. You know, if that was the end goal, then they would be citing how they can tie lowering crime statistics to their specific statute. But of course, that's not happening because they can't do that. So we know um, simply by action, not words, that this is just about preventing firearm ownership. Yeah, I agree. So, you know, San Diego, conceivably a purple city, right, is now imposing this. And I, I don't know yeah. what that, that means. Well, you know, it's an interesting question for, for our group and our, our modality of operation, which is at the county level, look how powerful or how successful San Diego County gun owners has been down there and they couldn't stop this. Right. Right. Um, it's, it's a little bit you know, not to mention the safe storage law that was what last year, two years ago, right? The, the quote unquote safe storage law for the, I think it was also the city. Um, it's, uh, it's quite humbling to see how little influence you have, even when you're doing so well down there in San Diego County. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you want to, make of our project then yeah uh, what what hope do we really have i mean what what hope would someone in san francisco have you know i mean well, none I, and i don't know yeah the the only thing i would say is that the city of san diego itself is so huge in terms of san diego county it sucks all the oxygen out of the county yeah and we don't have a parallel to that in orange county um, right. You know, That's some true. cities that are That's bigger true. than others, but just because one city does something, it doesn't mean that uh, other cities will follow or that it even affects a plurality, a large plurality, let alone a majority yeah. of the county. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, th there's going to there's going to be the same issue in uh, L.A. County. Yeah, because the city of L.A. is such a huge part. Um, I, I guess uh, the San, San Francisco County will have the same issue since it's the same jurisdiction as San Francisco City. Um, well, you know, why do you think that cities are like this? It seems like it's cities that are the problem. Why are cities like this? What, what, why do so many crazy gun laws come out of cities? You ever thought about that? Because this is really an urban versus rural issue. Yeah, and we absolutely. even we even have this problem. We even have this problem in rural-ish cities. Like L.A. City is a rural-ish city. There's not a lot of cities where you have you know mountain lions and coyotes running around and deer and there's a lot of rural areas, horseback stuff. So, you know, it's, it's, what is it about cities that, is there some insight that we can have about cities that can let us help, help, help us figure out how to hack, how to life hack or political hack these cities? Right. You know, to me, you have a dynamic, um, on city councils. I mean, you know, here again, especially in large cities, city councils matter. Um, mm -hmm. and, and normally we take kind of the view that somebody starts on a city council and it's not as big a deal and we're trying to catch them before they get to a more impactful seat. But here you're already having a pretty big impact um, certainly bigger than a state assembly district, 
right? The entire city of San Diego is bigger than your typical, I think any state assembly district because the, the one person one vote laws requires that they all be essentially equal population wise. And uh, so- um, I, think, I, I think assembly is what, 400,000 people? On yeah, I mean, like it's something Senate like that. is like 800. Yeah, so obviously the city's much larger. So the city council has a bigger impact here than at least an individual uh, assembly member. It, may, it might be good for you to explain what one person, one vote means for people. Yeah, so again, I'm not an expert. Election law is not my thing, but right. um, essentially... There's a requirement, I think, from the U.S. Supreme Court that yeah. um, states for their legislatures, so California mm -hmm. has a bicameral legislature, a state senate, right. and a state assembly, so two different mm -hmm. houses, and um, for each of those representatives, they need to represent an equal number of individuals so the voting right. by each representative is even. Um, we know that that's not necessarily the case for uh, the federal legislature. Um, it's no, close. Definitely not. Yeah, it, it, it's close-ish, <laughs> but uh, yeah. certainly in the they would, Senate. They would like it to be. They would yeah. like it to be. Yeah, in the Senate, that's not the case, which is the saving grace. Um, yeah. It's pretty close in the House. So um, as states get down to lower and lower populations, you can sneak in uh, with your one representative, even if you know your state population was one and you are three, I guess you'd have to have three, right? One person for each Senate seat and one for uh, uh, the representative. Yeah. But, um, you would still get it's a seat in the House of Representatives, even with a population of one conceivably. Yeah, uh, at the federal yeah, level, but yeah, at the right, state right. level, each rep has to um, yeah. represent the same number of people. Uh, so it's this one person yeah. vote. So my representative uh, has the same voting power essentially as your representative. And then not only that, you and I as individuals have the same voting power because the same number of people within these districts are voting for that representative. Um, and frankly, I think it's a little bit ridiculous, but, you know. I, I think it is too. I mean, it did it did come from the Supreme Court. And I, I it's been a while since I've read those cases. There's actually a, a, a famous one is Reynolds versus Sims. Um, there's some other ones that, I think Reynolds versus Sims is like the last one Okay. And uh, I think it was in 1964 or something like that. It was definitely during the Warren court period. So, you know, we have assembly and state Senate, which is modeled on allegedly it's modeled on Roman, uh, the Roman Republic, right? Where you had the, the plebeians and you had the patricians and you had well, you had an upper chamber and a lower chamber, and it's kind of it's similar in in uh, the parliament where you have House of Commons, House of Lords, um, and it's it's similar to the federal right where we have the House of Representatives and you have the Senate right, which is right. supposed to be um, the Senate on the federal side is not apportioned. There's, these are called apportionment cases. They're not apportioned by population. They're apportioned by a different method, just states. States right. get two. That's why they want to make D.C. a state, because it's automatically two, uh, right. two, two senators right there. And then it, it's like 95% Democrat. So that's why they want two yeah, senators. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, for a place like California, the way it used to be was um, that they're the uh, apportionment between Senate and the assembly was not based exactly on population like it is now where 
it's it's kind of silly the way it is now it's like i think the assembly you know i'm sorry i think i uh, how did i how did i say oh there are fewer senators i had it backwards there the assembly has i think is like 800,000 people in a district or something like that and then the senate i think is 400,000 or no the, no, no it's the, the, it's the other way around districts I had, I had are much right. larger i had it right i had it right yeah yeah so you have fewer senators so you have more people right but but it's like it's not clear exactly what the point of an upper house would be then why why would you have two houses um the way it used to be was that counties had a lot more sway in the senate not not in the assembly but in the senate so right. the assembly was pretty representative of the people but then this the rural areas had more popular pop, uh, power in the senate Right. And so rural areas could defend themselves against right. cities that basically that's what it meant is rural areas had fewer populations, but they had power in the Senate. And so they could defend them, defend themselves in the in the legislature um, against city people who city people have all sorts of crazy ideas that they think are good for everybody. You know, so, well, once the Supreme Court got rid of that, and they said one person, one vote. In other words, rural areas do not get any kind of foothold in the legislature. Right. Well, then it's just a it's just a numbers game. And so do you have a vortex going to some from Los Angeles and San Francisco to Sacramento? Right. And uh, ba everybody in Bakersfield and Fresno and these other areas, Shasta County. Right. Riverside County. You, you guys are you guys are chopped liver. I mean, you know, right. just because you're rural. Right. So, and if firearms legislation in particular, rural areas just have more common sense on firearms. That's kind of where I was going with this, right. With the city thing. Um, and the, the, for some reason in the cities, people, I, I, you could probably figure it out. I mean, people live closer to each other. And so there's more people that are more comfortable with making more rules about how to live together in a close way where people feel safer. Doesn't mean they are safer, but they just feel that way, right? right. So they get used to not being uh, legislating that they can't protect themselves from crime. And uh, they get used to that. And they, they, they you know, they feel allegedly they feel safer right because as soon as you see a gun it's a crime and so you just tell a police officer or whatever well but you know then it means that you can't defend yourself because just merely seeing a gun means you've committed a crime whereas you go out in the sticks in the rural areas and people are carrying guns on their hips and uh, it, would, it would be crazy for you to say i see a gun therefore that's a crime um because <laughs> Rural people have a little bit more common sense on that stuff. They 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 can put two and two together, and maybe they're not as rushed or something, and they have more time to think about things. But um, so yeah, that's um, that's that's kind of where we're at. Um, yeah. It did it did come from the Supreme Court, and that's a lot large reason why we have the problems we have as far as being a rural state. We are an incredibly rural state. Yes, but. <laughs> we we have crazy gun laws because we have big cities like los angeles and like right. the bay area yeah i mean so i think still to today and i would just have to confirm this but i know through at least 2010 um agriculture was the largest industry in california and mm -hmm. probably most people would be flabbergasted because most people live in cities and they just lack awareness that that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I wonder how much this, this virus panic of the last year and a half is going to have, I, I just wonder about the trends for cities because <laughs> now the, the city people were incredibly scared about this and they, the, 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 the rural areas were fine. Right. What, what are you talking about? There's no problem here. Yeah. Uh, so, so a lot of people in cities are kind of wondering, why don't I, why don't I live? I don't need to live here. I, I, it's really expensive. Um, I thought it was cool when I first moved here, but now I just kind of see 
that it's it's kind of worn off the cool factor is worn off and i'd rather actually be able to spread out and yeah with high speed internet what what problem do you have working from home and so it'd be interesting to see the migration that happens and maybe some of that common sense will rub off on people that move away from california to uh from more urban areas in california to rural areas in other states i don't know right yeah i don't know either but certainly i mean yeah. at least as far as this thing goes i think it's simply a matter of you have an anti-gun uh politician member of san diego city council and mm -hmm. you know they just articulate essentially an anecdotal case where, oh, this is so dangerous. They've got no statistics to, to back their public policy up. And again, you know, I think this is a huge failing. And I think societally, we fall into this trap more and more now, is that we yep. take a very anecdotal case you know, a very yeah. empirical case, like I know about this, I've experienced this myself. Yeah. And, and what we do is we expand that in our minds to this must be happening everywhere. Because if this happens to me, then this must happen to everybody. Well, mm -hmm. that's a very bad assumption to make. And mm -hmm. I think that leads to a lot of bad policy, but it could be used as a weapon too. And while I think politicians are dumb about a lot of things, um, I think they're very smart about getting reelected and shoving through policies based on these emotional arguments. And one of these, I, I think, easily is, you know, look, why would you want a firearm without a serial number unless you're a criminal? And that's why if you don't want it detected, it's because you're a criminal. And everybody, especially people not familiar with firearms or never even had right. a, a thought to maybe I would like to make my own because I can get something customized at a much lower cost than paying for someone else's labor to do that because it, it, their labor is not cheap. It's a specialized skill. So uh, the thought is, oh, these are all criminals. And so if we ban this, you know, it's very easy to convince people that we're not affecting everybody across the board. This is really only hitting criminals. And mm -hmm. yeah, obviously that's not the case. It, it, it's not just affecting criminals, but I think that's a story you tell, you get people to buy into it and, you know, everybody's more or less okay with it. And once you get past that point, now you're forced to change minds and it's always more difficult to change a mind than it is to yeah. convince somebody who has an open mind to a different conclusion. So uh, I think that's where this thing ends up. I mean, and what's the real motivation of the politician? Um, you know, the politician may actually believe that garbage story. Uh, I, I wouldn't put it past them that they, uh, don't believe that story. But I, I think at least some don't believe that story. And they're willing to tell that story as a weapon to get what they really want, which is outlawing possession. Period. Yeah, I, I wouldn't doubt that there that a lot of politicians are that dumb. Right. I mean, I'm sure they buy their <laughs> I, own story. It would not, that it would this can only me. be criminals, right? Well, it, the funny thing is, is that, um, well, it's not really funny, but <laughs> their, their law is what makes it only criminals that would do that. That That's what makes that criminal right. is that law. Right. So, so it's their action that makes it that only criminals do this because you've just criminalized innocent conduct. Right. I mean, I, 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 it's just like, uh, I don't know why people are so dumb. They can't see this, but yeah, if you, if you take innocent conduct and you criminalize it, then only criminals engage in that. Right. And you the, can the, get a, a very nice self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy. The, the um, normative question, the prior normative question before that is 
in what sense do you mean criminal? You clearly don't mean legal criminal. You mean moral. You mean right. some, they're doing something wrong, like ethically wrong. Um, they have some kind of nefarious motivation, some kind of, they, they want to hurt somebody. Right. It takes two seconds to figure out that it, it's quite possible that, in fact, maybe that the, the more power you have to defend yourself, the, the more you're going to fit that description of what they just talked about. I mean, right. the, 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 that's what I loved about Kavanaugh when I was reading Kavanaugh. His, his, uh, he had a dissent in a, an assault weapons case at D.C., and man, he really nailed it in that case. It was a, it's called Heller, Heller versus DC. I think it was Heller four or something like that. And uh, it's when um, Heller came down the first one and it was in 2008, I think. And it was then after that DC got slapped. And so the DC had to change their laws. And so then it was relitigated after DC changed the law and they added up some other stuff. They said, okay, we're going to ban assault weapons and there's other stuff they did. And so what Kavanaugh said was that uh, he, he just had a common sense point. He said, he said, we had to, we had to really do a discussion just on that dissent because there's so much there to unpack. But he said, you know, if you allow that people want to defend themselves from crime and violence, well, it just follows that, that, that the more you're able to defend yourself from crime, the more violent you can be. I mean, that, that it requires violence. Right. And uh, the more, the, the more, I think it was one of the arguments was um, they were worried that the, the assault weapons were very accurate. And so that therefore you can commit crime uh, in a, more effective way uh, for the criminal. And, and, and he was like, well, but that also means that you can defend yourself in a, in a more effective way. I right. mean, do you, do you want to hit innocent bystanders when you're defending yourself? No, you only want to hit the person that is hurt, trying to hurt you that you right. want accuracy. Accuracy is good. That's Absolutely. good. That's a good thing, you know? Right. So, but, but that's it goes to this thing of you know, just in general of empowering people to defend themselves, well, yeah, you're you're empowering them. I mean, they could use it for criminal, more immoral stuff. That's what I mean by criminal. In that case, it would be immoral stuff like murder. That's immoral. That's right. also criminal. Right. But you know, or or you know, something like that. But but if you just invent a crime in order to prevent the further crime, in case, so you, what you do is you gather all these people that fit this non-criminal activity. Then you say, okay, this is now criminal legally, even though it's not always more immoral. And then that way we're going to make it this immoral crime better. That we're going to lower those numbers. Well, it, it might be that that's what you do, but you are also trampling on all of this innocent people, all these innocent people and ability right. to defend themselves. And you know what's funny? I'm going to draw a little parallel. This has uh, prevented me from um, becoming an Orthodox Jew. So, like, this is the same reindeer game, right? And for those who don't know, so um, a lot of these rules, like Christians get off easy, good for them. I think it's the smarter choice. You essentially <laughs> come off with Ten Commandments, right? A nice set of guidelines but there's like 614 or 617 rules for Jews, right? This hammer, and then they make it worse. And I yeah, always wondered why, like, why is reform Judaism just replete with leftists? Like, it, it doesn't seem an inherently left-leaning re religion, but it's replete. Well, if you look at it, a lot of the rules uh, that are in place or rabbinical rules are essentially rules that will save you from actually committing or breaking one of the real rules. So you have this whole set of other rules that prevents you from breaking one of the rules. So just as yeah. a super simple one, like right, uh, right, right, yeah, cash root. So like kosher laws, right? If you actually read mm -hmm. Leviticus, like mm -hmm. the whole like no meat and cheese at the same time. 
is like, <laughs> you know, you're not going to consume um, uh, the mother's milk and, you know, the meat of the kid, whatever, at the same time. So to me, when I read it, um, I was like, well, you know, the really offensive thing is this very life-giving thing. You're eating that and then destroying the life that it was giving life to. And we, we don't want to do that. But I don't think it ever meant like you can't have a cheeseburger, right? From cheese from some other cow and the burger from, you know, an entirely different cow. But that's the rule to prevent you from accidentally breaking the real rule. You're just prohibited entirely. And so I think it's that mindset that, well, Sab Sabbath rules too. Sabbath. Yeah. Like, you, yeah. You can't, I mean, you can't turn the light off. Right. <laughs> so right. Because, you have to have a timer for the light. Yeah. Right. Because um, that's work. You, know, you don't want to start work. a fire and Deal dealing with electricity is work. Yeah. You don't want to start a fire. So electricity is somehow related to fire, which. Uh, I mean, I think we should update yeah. the technology on that one, but just setting all that aside, just the general idea of yeah. it's okay to have a whole set of rules to prevent you from doing this. So if we just ban firearms, that's okay because we're preventing murder, right? Sure. It, it's the same Sled idea. Sledgehammer approach, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's like, yeah. no, like, you know, this... The second order well, effects of this whole additional yeah. set of rules is entirely negative. And the value you get from actually preventing the breaking of the original rule might be minuscule. And have you ever actually looked after you promulgated this thing at the effectiveness? And it's like, well, if you never break the first rule, it's 100% effective. And I was like, sure, if you never break, but come on. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we catch Ben Shapiro's ire on this one then and he starts commenting on our videos and yeah because so, he's, oh, he's a he's a gun he's a gun owner yeah absolutely and, and so he's also orthodox so yeah i would welcome well, that debate with ben you know that makes me think about los angeles because he's from los angeles it makes right. me think of the difference between los angeles and new york um look at the draconian transportation laws that new york city has or even possession laws right like in your own home right you have to have a license to possess i think a handgun in your own home yes you do um and so if you have one of those nice brown stones i think there's like 22 to three thousand brown stones or there, you, if you're lucky enough to have one of those in what is it the upper west side you know you, you have all this space to kind of spread out. You might even have a rooftop to practice with your BB gun or whatever. But, but if you have a handgun in there, or I, I, it might even be any kind of gun, I don't know. But yeah, I don't uh, know. And, then, and then all these restrictions, on, you're a criminal if you don't have a license for that, if you don't have permission from the government. And, and if, you, if you want to transport it, all of these restrictions, I mean, and, and New York knew it was, it was unconstitutional. That's why they changed the law after they were sued. Right. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, we'll hear that case. And then they were like, oh, uh, uh, oh let's make it moot. Yeah. And that's how they won that. Um, and, and I kind of wish that, that the Supreme Court would have just went, a went ahead and decided it anyway. But, but Los Angeles doesn't have that. And Los Angeles doesn't have those issues. And I think it is because I've thought about this. And I think, I think it's because Los Angeles is a lot more rural than New York city is. That's my guess. And I'm not sure to what extent the rural versus city thing is intractable. And it's, it's more than we can bear. It's right. more than we can really handle as a second amendment organization, because it goes to truths, political science truths that are you know just intractable sociological problems right um it doesn't matter how much education you do right. if you look around cities around the, the whole world you know uh where people are tightly packed in they all have really bad gun laws and it's even worse in other countries i mean look at london right. for example that 
I mean, they'll they'll brag about it on social media if they find you with a pair of pliers, or, right? Exactly. You know, a screwdriver or something like, oh yeah, you were gonna you were gonna <laughs> you were gonna stab somebody in the in the neck. Right. Uh, well, so now we're the debate there is whether they can carry a screwdriver in their pocket around, right? In in uh, London, uh, so. I mean, in that sense, we're doing a lot better here in America. I mean, people always compare us to, to England and they say, why can't we be more like England? They have hardly any violence. Well, yeah, but you're also a criminal automatically if you have a normal tool from Ace Hardware. <laughs> so, right. So look at the look at what they had to do. I mean, yeah, I mean, well, it's kind of like, yeah, there's not going to be any crime if you drop an atomic bomb on San Diego. You can get rid of all gun gun pr- crime crime. But right. you also just killed everybody. So, you know, right. you might want to think about, you know, that's a good way to get rid of all the COVID. Just just nuke everybody, you know? Yeah. And then so yeah, no more Rona from Saul. <laughs> what you know, you what about protecting people's rights? What about well, that? and then you know, no no more murder, no more gun crime, whatever that is, right? Yeah. Um, if you just kill everyone, you know, yeah. and, and this is everything else if something's You're... illegal if you just make it legal then it's not a crime anymore yeah or, or you know if, if it's legal then let's just make it illegal you know there's all this hey, we beat this one up pretty well i want to move <laughs> on to happier pastures um so practical for that. advice i know mm. uh, you've got some uh in this particular area for you know how to comply and stay happy as a gun owner, be a participating shooter, you know, uh, uh, excuse the phrase, but I'm gonna use an active shooter, right? Somebody who actually goes out and shoots their firearms legally, of course, um, not in the commission of a crime, um, rather than just stares at them in the gun safe or whatever. So, um, you know, your thoughts on ways you found um to get down that road how to be happy (laughs) yeah like um you know find some joy in it because you know it could just be frustrating you know like hey right right i I, want to participate in firearms i heard about you know this uh glock 19 that's i think right right oh you can't get it it's not on the handgun roster i don't know if that's true by the way but i'm just using that as an example, whether it's correct or incorrect. Um, But, you know, pick your firearm that's not on the roster and you just can't do it. It's banned for no particularly good reason in this state. You know, the things that we can do um, that maybe some folks don't know about, um, roads we can go down still that they haven't gotten to yet. And I don't know, maybe this is a bad idea. Maybe we keep our trap shut to not right. give anybody any ideas of, oh, well, you should shut this down. People are having fun. You know, uh, Gavin Newsom yeah. is still alive and well uh, in terms of being the governor. So I'm sure he'll be emboldened and looking to uh, crush more fun. You know, next lockdown probably starts tomorrow. But, you know, setting that aside, <laughs> are there well, some potential things? Sure. Um there's a couple different issues there. I, I don't know if I should, how, what I should respond to first, but I guess I'll just take the last one first about Gavin Newsom. Um, I would just say congratulations to Governor Newsom for surviving the recall. Um, and I think that he probably would it would be great if he became comfortable in that because in a way because he's now on the hook he's totally on the hook for ev- how everything turns out it's true and i'm also going to point out that um i i was not surprised i was disappointed that larry elder who we just we just interviewed uh, on gun owners radio uh, right. i think it was a couple days ago must have been Uh, because i think they're on sunday right so um but i'm a huge fan of of larry elder i used to be bigger and then i lost all this weight you're going to get that at 2 2 a.m and not be able to fall asleep (laughs) but um (laughs) but but um he uh 
he was not like Schwarzenegger the last time we had a recall. Right. Schwarzenegger was in an enormously advantageous position for that. He had a film called Total Recall. Okay. So, so all he had to do was put that on, slap that on a bus. And then he was in another film called The Terminator. And all he had to do was say, we're going to terminate Gray Davis. And that worked. And 60 million people saw that, that, those films. And, but, but Larry, you know, he, he has a good audience. I mean, he, I think several, you know, few million people across the country, right. but a lot of people were, were not sure who he was exactly. And they, this was their first introduction to him. A lot of good people with common sense who, who think about things and maybe they voted for, for uh, Newsom. I believe that there are lots of people that voted for Newsom who, if they really got a fair look at elder, they would change their they would have they would regret their vote right and and i i believe because he's just not well known and 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 his and and elder has another extreme advantage which is he has been doing statesmanship for decades so his record for all this oppo research anybody who digs in is going to only find substantive political commentary Right. <laughs> so, so the, the risk of, do, you know, sending operatives to do oppo research on him, you're probably going to get a bunch of defections because he is extremely persuasive. So anyway, that's my little two cents on that. But you asked about being, um, being happy and stuff. And I, I, I guess, uh, as far as the, I, I'm sorry if I'm being a little bit Asperger's or whatever, but like, um, as far as the roster goes, how to deal with that. Um, well, let me just make a comment. I think it lacks rational basis uh, and just in terms of the exceptions, because there are exceptions that they made for that roster. Number one is um, emergency personnel. I believe it's, is it just police officers or is it emergency personnel? Well, I think it's just police officers. Now at this point, it's, they've actually peace officers, right? gone down the road of naming all the particular agencies that qualify. Okay. And it's like, do are they all Harvard sworn to qualify? And they're all so if you're a sworn peace officer, that's pretty much automatic. Yeah, exemption I think for so. That. Um, but you know, regardless well, of um, sure, so yeah, that, that, peculiarity, that exemption, in general, that's true. And sworn, that exemption would be justified yeah. on what basis it would be justified because presumably higher training, right? Right, I would assume, right. Right. But but high, but training has never been more accessible to anybody. Right. The same the same training. In fact, it's oftentimes police officers given the giving this training for like right. CCWs and stuff. The same training that you need. Uh, you maybe you could have a little bit more attack on four hours or whatever. But but it seems like if you're if <laughs> the, the rationale is the DOJ is determined that these models you, maybe they used to uh, be safe, but now we can't determine if they're safe, so they're not on the list. And uh, you got to pay us a fee, and we got to drop it down some stairs and see if it still doesn't shoot. And <clears throat> whatever, basically, it's just you know a racket for them to get fees or whatever from right. these manufacturers. But but um, so if if, uh, if it's okay to let people who are trained have those guns in other words they're not going to be unsafe then i don't understand why you you wouldn't just require more training to buy and just get rid of the roster right i don't i don't understand or or maybe just as an if it's not on the roster then you need to have a special permit to buy it or something like that i don't know um but they're also available on the used market Right. So well, the, the the private market has these guns, and there's no. Do we have a, any data that that uh, if you buy a Colt Python, which has not been on the roster maybe like ever? I mean, right. okay. Now I'm not talking about the new one. I'm talking about the old one. Right. The new one is on the roster, I think. But well, it's a the, revolver, the older... so it's exempt. So yeah, it, it, it wouldn't be on the roster because it's exempt as a re- revolver. Okay, I'd have to. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not up on the 
the details of that, but, but, um, you know, I mean, so you're asking how to, how to be happy. I, I guess I've just got into the used market here in California. I've gotten, um, pretty, I mean, I mean, I'm not like crazy, um, familiar with a lot of that stuff, but I've gone down, down some rabbit holes and I've tried to learn about the history of firearms because the, it's still legal to do that. And, um, and I've just kind of gone with what is interesting to me and right. let myself just kind of, you know, develop some, some interest and taste on that. And it's, it's provided a lot of happiness for me over the years. Um, I've met a lot of good people, a lot of interesting people in California on the used market. I guess I can give them, I can mention the website that is pretty uh, useful is CalGuns, CalGuns.net. It's a very useful community for, it's not only a bunch of forums, but it's a, it's a community enforced uh, social credit rating for buying and selling yeah. stuff. So there's some there's there's some vulnerabilities there that are unique in California when you're buying and selling firearms. One would be um, there's a 10 day waiting period, and because you have a 10 day waiting period, that puts uh, that that makes some people kind of vulnerable. Like say let's say uh, let's say you're 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 buying a gun and you pay cash for it. And, and you, you have a cash transaction at the point of sale. Well, now you have, the government has said you have to have a licensed firearm dealer do a background check and start a 10 day wait. Well, if what happens when, it, what, what if there's a mistake on the government side and you fail that background or it's held up somehow? Well, you're out that cash. And the other person still owns that firearm. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I suppose that you could sue them in small claims court, but oftentimes these transactioners are extremely private and you might not even know the person's name. Right. Um, but yeah, presumably you could get that information or something, but, but so CalGuns provides kind of a, a con, a community where you could at least figure out who that person is and give them a rating or whatever. It, it might be that, um, you know, <laughs> it, it just makes things weird and awkward when yes. you're, when you're, you know, it doesn't happen very often, but it's possible. And, um, it, other States that don't have these waiting periods don't have to deal with that. So right. you, you own the, you own it when you transfer it. That, right. But here there's a delay in the transfer. And uh, what, what happens if there's a virus lockdown and, and the government says, well, you're not essential business for now. And you're in your 10 day waiting period. And so what people don't really realize is that that 10 day waiting period is often is also accompanied by a 20 day window to pick up the gun. Right. And if you don't get in there to pick up the gun after the, because it's every 30 days, you have to start another background right. check and, and co it costs more money. And uh, there are restrictions on how long that dealer can hold on to that gun before they have to relinquish it back to the original person or law enforcement or something like that. So there were, there are people that had this issue of, can they, and, and back when the virus was really bad, the virus lockdowns, there were people that were worried they weren't going to be able to pick up their gun because the, the government was so late on background that they weren't ready to release that weapon. And they have like, um, I think they have 30 days of discretion. I think they have, well, maybe, maybe it's not 30. Yeah. I think they, I think they have 30 days. And I think the firearm dealers that I've talked to, they said, if it's undetermined at the 30 day mark, they're required to, the dealer is required to release the firearm to the purchaser. So, and then I guess it's just up to the police to follow up and, you know, but, but that's been a, um, 
especially 22s, I, because of ammo prices, I thought, you know, I'm interested in 22s all of a sudden again. And, and uh, there's so many, there's so, just with 22s alone, there's so much history and development. And so that's been a source of joy. And I, I would just recommend, um, you know, get into some of this stuff. Just think about the history and the development of this wonderful technology that yeah. you can be a part of. You can still be a part of this. This has changed so many people's lives. Being able to go hunting, being able to defend your family. Um, it's, it's cool. It's, yeah. it's a cool history. It's, it's, I'm, I'm constantly learning stuff and I, 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 I'm really surprised. It's like, I've con I, I constantly see things that I've never seen before. And just when I thought I could never see something I've never seen before there, there's something I've never seen before. I would recommend, I'm just going to say it because they've been kind to us. I, I recommend getting, um, getting in touch with like an auction house that deals with this. And so a, a local one for us is Carol Watson's orange coast auctions. They have a showroom. They have three times a year auctions. They have a showroom, which is unique about them. You can make an appointment, I think, or sometimes just walk in and, um, and you can pick up the long guns and look at them. And there are a ton of historical items there. Um, samurai swords um artwork from like winchester and stuff like that artwork that's actually beyond my price range but they had a remington they had a remington um bronze that was called uh what's that called bucking bronco or something like that okay, it's a famous so, one roosevelt um, used to have it in the white house so yeah so uh i'm gonna jump in here so uh, I was very lucky last month, um, first family vacation in a while, and we went to Wyoming. And oh, if you're wow. in Wyoming, um, you know, Yellowstone's a big attraction, but I recommend you come out the eastern side of Yellowstone and you go to Cody. And in Cody, uh, mm -hmm. which is a city started by Buffalo Bill, uh, thus the name, uh, you will find the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. And this is a Smithsonian affiliated museum, uh, which is really composed of five separate museums. And you just basically touched on two of the big ones, at least for me. When I say big ones, they were important for me that I wanted to see. Um, they're all roughly of the same size. Uh, but the Cody Firearms Museum Oh. has an extensive collection mm -hmm. of artifacts um, and you will walk through time you will see the history the development um, technology use um, the uh, meandering offerings of products by manufacturers based on the needs of a particular time. Um, yeah, yeah. Amazing. And then the second one is uh, the Whitney Museum of Western Art. And they have, look, I'm a, I'm a Frederick Remington freak. So what mm. people don't know about Remington, right? Remington no, no, no relation. Russell, what's no that? relation to Remington Arms. No right, relation. Right, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. No relation, but uh, Frederick <clears throat> Remington and Charles Russell are probably the two most well-known Western artists. So their, their art is largely Western themed. Um, what's the so, second one's name? What's that? What was the second one's name? Uh, Remington and who? First one, Charles Russell. Oh, Charles Russell, okay. Yeah, and, and then Frederick Remington. So look, Remington, his studio's in New Rochelle. So if you don't know about the New York metro area, this is south of Yonkers. Like it's almost hmm. in the Bronx, right? Um, it, it is just barely outside New York City limits. Um, and of course- Kim Kimber you know, is based in Yonkers. Yeah, so- Kimber, Kim They make Kimber, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, that's where a studio was, but 
he relied on extensive trips to the West to get subject matter. Um, but a lot of times he would finish paintings with guys sitting on barrels in his studio to replicate a horse, right? Um, but Remington is the best. And at mm. the Whitney, they have the original Bronco Buster. Oh, so wow. It, it, it's spelled Broncho, it. right? For whatever reason, I don't know. Um, but it's the very original one that's Frederick Remington's first ever sculpture. And unlike a lot of other Western sculptures, um, he made it super accurate. Uh, and that was one of the biggest deals about it, why it was so widely popular. Um, yeah, I, I would love to get myself a copy, um, not even actual size, but um, um, for those of you that are Facebook friends, you know, feel free to go back in my feed and you'll see multiple pictures of when I was at the Whitney and just was absolutely flabbergasted as I came across the original Bronco Buster and just started taking picture after picture. But anyway, um, yeah, certainly if you're into history of firearms, you happen to be, you know, contemplating a trip, say to Yellowstone, this is an easy add on. Uh, the Buffalo Bill Center of the West is an amazing, amazing, amazing museum. Again, Smithsonian affiliate, Smithsonian quality. Those are two of the five museums. You've got the Draper Natural History, you got the Plains Indian Museum. And uh, then you also have um, ah, the fifth one, uh, Natural History, Plains Indian, uh, Whitney Museum. Oh, well, the, it's the Buffalo Bill, like essentially uh, biographical museum. And mm. they're all great. Um, we had a great time. They do live shows with uh, raptors. So they bring out these different birds, all of them raptors and uh, different types um, and, and run you through and, and let you take a close up look out in a garden. Uh, they got Buffalo Bill's childhood home transported because uh, he lived nowhere near uh, Cody, Wyoming uh, on the plains in Kansas. He grew wow. up. So um, anyway, a great place. So a plug given that you uh, brought yeah. up both those, but, you know, again, as far as enjoying historical, yeah, you got to get, uh, well, there's the auction place. Okay. And on Facebook, no less. Right. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. That, that went for 2,400 and that was yeah. on, we were there, we were running a table that day. That was July 31st. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's cool, man. I saw it in person and it was huge. Yeah. And, um, I, I thought maybe, uh, I'll have a leg up if, if, I mean, not like I have any money to spend, but maybe I'll have a leg up because no one wants to pay for shipping. Right. And I could just pick it. I could just pick it up, but no, exactly. And the, the but, original, no, <laughs> no, fairly large. I want to say the originals pushing, you know, 28, 30 inches, something like that. Um, height uh yeah but, that that that's that's a i think it was one of a hundred copies of it or something okay. i think it was number 23 or something but i've got a i've got a large remington in my uh in my office at home okay yeah it's it's the pawnee uh, pawnee on the plane i'll have to send a picture of it but i i inherited that from my grandfather who had right. it in his cabin in cal in colorado um and then my parents had it for a while, but, um, yeah, that I, I, uh, I've been reading up on Remington and, uh, I, I have to agree with you. Um, in fact, I was in Arkansas and we were in the home of, I think it was what, where's Walmart from Bentonville. Uh, Bentonville. That's right. And there was, um, there was a used bookstore there. In the, on the square and i came upon a, a book a picture book of remington from the 50s oh nice. and i said i have to i have to have this because it had some of the prints and stuff and i was right. looking for the one i have it's not in there but and it's a little bit biography of his life you know and anyway but uh firearms are a huge part of his his life and um I, i've just been enjoying like you know in my in my collecting activities over the past just 
just finding I, i'm kind of sentimental so that helps right uh if you're not sentimental then this is going to be the most boring oc geo 2a discussion night at all but but uh th there was this one uh cult woodsman that was from the 50s that this guy had found in his i think it was his wife's mom's or grandma's drawer and it still had the tag from uh one of those block one of those department stores in the mall i think right. it was montgomery montgomery ward it was montgomery ward right. and it had the serial number montgomery ward and it had a national rifle association membership form i guess she never filled it out and sent it in and it had that stuff with the so it was a, it was a, just a time capsule look into 1956 right. in california and it, it was in california and I was like, Montgomery Ward, of course, Montgomery Ward. I grew up with Montgomery Ward. Do you remember G Montgomery yeah, Ward? Yeah, oh, absolutely. They used to sell Colts there. Yeah. And I, I just, I'm such a sucker for that, you know, just going to the mall and picking up a pistol. How cool was that? Right. And uh, the fact that it was in such good condition, too, is like immaculate condition. And the NRA thing. A lot of people say NRA, that wasn't even a legislative thing back then. They were not, they weren't interested. I, well, actually I beg to differ. Right. They, they, there was, I mean, you know, it was pretty clearly political. Even you know, if you're buying a gun. Yeah. Right. So, um, I, I just, I just enjoy that stuff. And that's, um, that's expensive hobby, but, um, I, I, I certainly couldn't just continue doing it unless I change my life income majorly, but, right. um, but who knows where things are going to be going? I mean, like, geez, uh, things are shutting down suit plantation shut down. Yep. Where are we going? Yeah. I don't so know. Just acquire is what I would say. Yeah. And same, same view I had about ammunition, just, it's, it's crazy the restrictions so yeah well um, we're, we're 20 22s get it get into 22s at least so yeah <laughs> well we're pushing past an hour so i will add one quick thing and uh yeah we'll we'll leave it at that um to tag onto the historical thing um you know california still has a single shot exemption so you know if anybody has mm. an interest in the old west and maybe you like um cosplay to some extent or you know at least wearing a cowboy hat um cowboy action shooting might be your thing and so this is three gun uh but totally california legal and so you get a couple um single action revolvers of whatever flavor and there's all kinds of replicas made now um, they're not necessarily cheap, what I would call cheap. I mean, you're not going to get your hundred dollar replica, but, uh, but they're real guns though. They're not, yeah. you, when you say replica, you mean they're real. Yeah. They yeah. are an operating firearm that is a, yeah. a copy of something that is essentially no longer manufactured. Yeah. Uh, right. A single okay. action gotcha. army. They're not making anymore, but they're making yeah. these copies. That's um, cool. That's cool. So grab a couple of those. You grab yeah. a lever action rifle and uh, either a side-by-side -side, uh, shotgun or there's certain um, pump shotguns that are legal under their rules. And you can basically go do three gun, um, you know, slapped in a pair of jeans and a cowboy hat anyway. Uh, but you can get much more into the costuming aspect if you wish. Uh, where, where do required. people go for that? Where do people go to you know, inquire about that? So this is going to blow a lot of people's minds. This sport started in Corona. And oh, I didn't know that. There is still a uh, uh, club. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> that's exactly the right term, but... Um, and, and I can't remember. It's Corona something or other, and they shoot at Rahagis. So, huh. um, wow, they, that's where you'd go. Um, so we and, go and to the, so if you really just want to find out general information, the single action shooting society, SAS, 
Oh, okay. um, it, it is where you go and you can get a SAS membership. I've been a member member for a while. Um, I pulled wow. my name from uh, John Wayne's character and she wore a yellow ribbon uh, where he portrayed Lieutenant Colonel Kirby York. So um, you get this SAS name, mine's Lieutenant Colonel York. And they will issue you a badge, a six pointed star badge with your membership number on it. And, uh, you know, they have, um, when they have like a, a, a shooting tournament, a lot of times it comes with um, kind of almost a full village where food and beverage, and then you'll have a lot of vendor stalls. And of course you have a, a lot of people dressed up. So it's kind of like a little bit of a wild west renaissance fair, not really. Um, they're not quite that into it, uh, but, it, but the main event is of course uh, the shooting. And in terms of cost, although it's difficult to get reloading equipment now, it is a little bit cheaper because you don't fire that many rounds. I mean, a single stage will be 10 revolver rounds, 10 rifle rounds, and two to six shotgun rounds. So right. you, you're not firing a whole lot on any particular stage. And there are people following behind you with nets and uh, you know grabbers picking up your casings. Obviously not a problem for revolver. They're still in there. You're just going to empty it and put it in your bucket. But uh, all your lever action rifle casings, they're picking them up and they hand them to you at the end of the stage you can go reload um, that's nice yeah shotgun shells you're out the window but okay i mean a box of shells gets you through an entire tournament so um huh. you know it, it's a, a little bit less expensive uh as well so anyway yeah. um it gets you the the history um because it's all single action and lever action rifles and pump yeah. and side-by-side -side shotguns you, you know you're fully california legal and you get the thrill. Now, um, I think if Gavin Newsom ever saw some of the YouTube videos of these tournaments, he'd probably get apoplectic and be running to ban lever action rifles given the speed with which some of these cats can shoot. But um, uh, I love I, lever actions are awesome. Yeah. Uh, at least we're not there awesome. yet. And yeah, um, you know, well, that's a good it, point. I mean, a lot of people are tactical, tactical. There's a lot of tactical cool people in our community, but I think it's good to it's good to spread out the love like we're doing here. And I'm all about preserving a heritage like this. The the California you see now we have a we have an opportunity not only with, with the activism we're doing in terms of policy, but the activism we could be doing in terms of culture was we there there is there are people dying in california that have guns that are older people right what's going to happen to those guns <laughs> you know you know we should be preserving this heritage as best we can because a lot of people are not really paying it that's not on their radar what's happening to their precious older guns right and a lot of these guns let's face it are way better made than the ones that are made now right and uh, you know not to to, I mean, I like, I like Glock Glock. It is a quality firearm. I'll, I'll give you that. But a lot of these firearms that were made like over a hundred years ago are better guns. Actually. Right. I mean, they're, they're, they're the, the machining and the, and the, the craftsmanship is, is actually superior in my right. view. And I, I mean, I, I challenge you to, you know, prove me wrong. Well, you know, I, I remember when I, I felt a, a Winchester pump action 22. I mean, it was perfectly revolting to me the first time I saw one. I was like, a, a, a pump action 22 rifle. Ah, but it was a Winchester, so I gave it the benefit of the doubt. And I, I saw, I pumped it back and I, I, I saw the machining on this. And I was like, they do not make that kind of fit and finish anymore. Yeah. This is, this is precision craftsmanship. Yeah. Like and it was in really good shape. You're talking about like a model um, 1890. I don't. I wish I knew. I don't know. I think it was a, a model 62 or something like that. Okay. I, and I think it's from before. It's from the before the Great Depression. Yeah. But, yeah. 
Uh, but I maybe mean, after a couple World different War I, something like that. Slide action 22s. And yeah. So, you know, yeah. similar yeah. thing. I was into well, collecting yeah. every John Browning designed 22 rifle. And okay. so the model 1890 is a Winchester. He sold the, his patent to Winchester. Um, and it's a, a slide action. Wouldn't surprise me. Um, 22. Yeah. In fact, the vast majority of his, his first patents were simple sales to Winchester. No royalty, just an outright sale of the patent uh, to okay. Winchester. It was only later when he started retaining patents and licensing. Um he was an impressive if, guy. Yeah, if if you're in Utah, and um, he was Mormon, he, he was yeah, a Mormon. Um, a lot of people don't know that. Yeah, uh, if you know, for some reason, you fly into Salt Lake City, your your Salt Lake City Metro. Um, mm -hmm. If you go just north of Salt Lake City, um, oh Ogden. If you go to Ogden, which is just north of Salt Lake City, it's college town, the, the John Browning Museum, and it's not quite a Cody firearms museum, but it is nice and it's all about John Browning and John Browning designs, and um, it's very cool. So, another one, um, you know, there's kind of a theme Mountain West states are, are kind of doing well. Um, you know, maybe a reason why they're attractive to my eye, but yeah, well, preserving that heritage is, I think, a crucial part of our culture, our battle here, because I think politics is downstream from culture. Yep. So we have to preserve that culture. And I think it's interesting enough for people if they get into it, if they figure out if they if they're exposed to it, it's very interesting and it's inherently interesting. And um, I think it will have political, it will help us politically. Yeah, I think. Yes, especially little kids. I mean, getting kids. I don't know why we don't teach this stuff. And, and why is this? This alone, we can't teach this. I mean, that you know, we should be teaching this stuff. This is a, this is history. Right. This is American history. Right. So that's my view. But For I'm sure. a teacher. So. All right. Well, uh, again, we're well past an hour, so we'll leave it at that um uh, you know on a good note and uh um we'll swing back around next month with uh something sounds good else exciting all right well appreciate all right sounds time. good <laughs> all okay right. take it easy see you bye, bye.